So the background from Keynote 355 is that, uh, first of all, triple negative breast cancer represents an unmet need, particularly in the metastatic setting where the median survival is significantly less than two years. There are limited treatment options. And until quite recently, we only had chemotherapy. We now have an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, but the interest in immunotherapy came from understanding the biology of triple negative disease, which is that uh, this cancer has more expression of PDL1 on the tumor and immune cells, and there are more tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and it has a higher mutational complexity. So all of those factors have been associated with greater response to checkpoint inhibitors in other diseases where there are high responses. So there were basket trials where different diseases were treated with single agent immunotherapy. Three different trials were done. And in particular for pembrolizumab and atezolizumab, single res agent response rates were just under 20%. And some responses were extremely durable, something we'd never seen before. So then the trials were expanded. And what we found out from those expansions was that the responses really were only seen in the first line setting. It was extremely low afterwards. And that PDL1 appeared to be a predictor of response, although it wasn't clear entirely. So the combination of chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors was based on data suggesting that chemotherapy increases the uh, essentially the immune environment. It changes the immune environment of the cancer. There's more infiltration of these uh, lymphocytes into the tumor with chemotherapy, and you might expose neoantigens that would enhance the host immune response and therefore make the tumors uh, potentially more responsive to checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, actually two randomized trials were done first in the first line setting, and now there's been a third trial, um, two trials with atezolizumab and then Keynote 355. So that's really the background of where the trial came about from, uh, meeting an unmet need, targeting a population uh, also that might have a better response to checkpoint inhibitors and using chemotherapy in combination based on a rational approach. So Keynote 355 is a randomized phase three double blind trial that treated patients who had metastatic or a de novo metastatic, uh, so metastatic recurrent or de novo metastatic triple negative breast cancer where their last treatment in the curative setting, so adjuvant or neoadjuvant, uh, was uh, six months or uh, longer before uh, entry onto the trial or diagnosis of metastatic disease. Uh, patients uh, were eligible, as I mentioned, either with de novo or recurrent metastatic disease and were randomized two to one to receive either pembrolizumab or placebo in combination with a menu of chemotherapy that included paclitaxel, nabpaclitaxel, or gemcitabine and carboplatin. And then the, the goal of the trial, of course, was to see whether pembrolizumab improved outcome variables. And the primary outcomes were two, uh, progression-free survival and overall survival. And the statistical design included evaluating these endpoints in both patients who had pdl one positive uh, disease and in the overall intent to treat population because pdl one positivity was not required in order to enter onto Keynote 355. Well, first, uh, if you looked at the different PDL1 factors, patients were stratified based on PDL1 positivity of one or more uh, versus not. Uh, but the three different categories that were evaluated were uh, CPS 10 or greater, CPS 1 or greater, or intent to treat the overall population. PDL1 was evaluated in Keno 355 and is evaluated for pembrolizumab using a scoring system called CPS or the combined positive score. This uses an antibody called 22C3. It looks at PDL1 on lymphocytes, macrophages, and tumor cells and divides that by the number of uh, tumor cells times 100. So you get a score. In contrast, uh, the PDL1 positivity for atezolizumab is defined as having a 1% or greater uh, score by immunohistochemistry using the SP142 assay in tumor immune cells, not in the tumor cells. So these are a little bit different. In uh, Keynote 355, 38% of patients had a CPS of 10 or greater, and then 75% of patients had a CPS of one or greater. And this has been seen before. CPS of 10 or greater really enriches the PDL1 positive population. And the percentage is similar to Impassion 130 using SP142, which was 41%, although there's incomplete overlap 
as shown in a recent publication uh, that I'm the first author for in JNCI, uh, where although many tumors are positive with both tests, a small percentage are positive with only one test or the other. So the primary uh, first primary endpoint of this study has already been presented and published by Javier Cortez, showing that progression-free survival was significantly prolonged in patients receiving pembrolizumab versus placebo with chemotherapy. Progression-free survival in the CPS or 10, of 10 or greater population uh, was increased by 4.1 months from 5.6 to 9.7 months for hazard ratio 0.66. Based on this data, Actually, this combination received accelerated approval by the US FDA, and this has now been converted to a final formal approval. In the PDL1 CPS of one or greater in intent to treat population, uh, there was a small numeric difference, uh, but this was not statistically significant uh, and really was driven by this 38% of patients with CPS of 10 or greater. So the purpose of this presentation was to look at the final overall survival analysis, an endpoint we've been looking for for a long time to understand the true benefit of pembrolizumab in terms of survival, sort of our gold standard endpoint. Overall survival was significantly prolonged in patients who had PD-L1 positive disease with a CPS of 10 or greater who received pembrolizumab and chemotherapy versus the placebo and chemotherapy. The uh, median overall survival was 16.1 months in the control arm and 23 months in the patients receiving pembrolizumab for an absolute difference of almost seven months. The p-value was highly significant and crossed the pre-specified p-value boundary. Uh, the p-value for this uh, analysis was 0 0.0093 with a hazard ratio of 0.73. Also, I think landmark analyses can be really helpful when we're thinking about this in terms of its clinical implications. The landmark analysis at 24 months showed that 34% of patients were alive who received the control arm chemotherapy alone versus 48.2% in patients receiving uh, the pembrolizumab and chemotherapy combination. So uh, really a big difference. We also looked at the CPS of one or greater and intent to treat population. And although there was a numeric difference in the CPS of one or greater, this was not statistically significant. Um, and the same was true in the intent to treat population. We looked at overall survival in the CPS subgroups. And of course, the biggest uh, factor was CPS of 10 or greater. Uh, and then we looked at other clinically relevant subgroups and patients seemed to benefit regardless of the endpoint. The only difference were patients who had a disease-free interval of less than 12 months. This represented only 65 patients, um, and we weren't powered to really look at this difference. Uh, we looked in this uh, analysis at additional secondary endpoints, including the overall response rate, disease control rate, and duration of response, all of which were significantly greater in patients receiving pembrolizumab. In particular, the duration of response was significantly longer at 12.8 months with pembrolizumab and just 7.3 months with placebo. And the landmark analysis at 12 months, which is really striking, about 38% of patients with still responding disease in the control arm and almost 56% in patients receiving pembrolizumab. And then, of course, it's critical to look at adverse events whenever you're adding a new agent to standard chemotherapy or when you're using a new agent in any setting. Treatment-related adverse events uh, were about the same, all treatment-related adverse events, regardless of use of pembrolizumab or not, but there was more discontinuations of any drug due to treatment-related AEs in patients receiving pembrolizumab. We're always particularly interested in immune-mediated adverse events, or IRAEs. Only 2.8% of patients discontinued PEMBRO due to IRAEs, which is very encouraging. And there were no IRAEs that led to death in the pembrolizumab arm. The most common immune-related toxicities were similar to all other trials with combination checkpoint inhibitors and chemo, with thyroid disorders by far the greatest, and then pneumonitis, colitis, and skin reactions uh, were all those that were uh, greater than 1%. But these numbers for the additional three toxicities were all under 3%. So this data really solidifies the role of pembrolizumab combined with chemotherapy as a new standard of care for patients who have locally recurrent, unresectable, or metastatic triple negative breast cancer 
and whose tumors express PDL1 defined as a CPS of 10 or greater. I think that um, the, clearly the statistical design of these trials is really important when we're uh, thinking about analyzing data. And a lot of people have questions about the recent uh, Roche withdrawal of accelerated approval of atezolizumab combined with nabpaclitaxel. Because the statistical design for overall survival and PFS was hierarchical, uh, it turned out that you could only make a statistical claim of overall survival benefit um, if overall survival was significantly improved in the intent to treat population. Because it wasn't, it was only improved in the PDL1 positive population. They received accelerated approval, and that requires confirmatory data for final approval. Unfortunately, in Passion 131, for reasons unclear to everyone at present, uh, did not show a benefit from adding a tezolizumab to, to paclitaxel. There was the thought that maybe it was steroids, but steroids were used in a Keynote 355, and we clearly saw a benefit. We also thought that maybe there's a factor in the control population that was PDL1 positive that isn't stratified for or measured because overall survival in the control arm of PDL1 positive patients in Impassion 131 was 28 months compared to under 20 months in Impassion 130 and 16 months when you take an earlier relapsing population in Keynote 355. So atezolizumab is still approved in other countries, and I think it's encouraging that the survival differences are almost identical. Uh, seven months in the final uh, protocol specified OS for Impassion 130, and about seven months here in Keynote 355. Regardless, pembrolizumab remains the only approved checkpoint inhibitor in this setting in the United States in combination with chemotherapy. And it's really nice to have this data for our patients and to have a menu of chemotherapy to use depending on what patients have received in the past. Regardless, if possible, we should be treating patients with optimal therapy in the early stage setting. And the results from Keynote 522 that were also discussed at ESMO 21 are really striking with an improvement in event-free survival. And I feel that patients who have at least stage two, early stage triple negative breast cancer should receive neoadjuvant therapy with pembrolizumab and chemotherapy. The question about who needs pembrolizumab after surgery remains to be answered, but Keynote 522 continued pembrolizumab in all patients for a total of one year.